15. Hello and welcome to all of you. I hope you can hear me okay. It is such a pleasure to talk to you this evening. I want to start with a question. Can finding women in the past help us shape a better, fairer future? It's a big claim for a historian, but I think the answer is yes. And I wanna take you with me as we challenge some historical mistruths, as we reveal new evidence, new ways of looking to the past and try to understand the stories that we've been told about, about history. And um, thinking first off about women's rights, Surely we're on this trajectory, always moving forward through history, that we are in a constant state of progress, building on the achievements of those that have gone before, um, growing towards a fair, fairer, more equal future. Well, yes, in some ways, but in others, no. And we begin our story in many cases thinking about the rights of women just in the last hundred years. We could say, couldn't we, that um, the, the, the rights that I as a woman have today is a direct result of the efforts made by the suffragettes a hundred years ago. That's, that's when these, these rights began, sure, yeah? Well, that's not the full story. For me to be able to take you back in time, let's go back firstly, just 100 years. Now, I am a medievalist. I'm going to be taking you many hundreds of years, indeed, many thousands of years back in just 15 minutes. But let's start in the summer of 1913 at the Epsom Derby. Now, this was the major historic um, sporting event in the Edwardian calendar. Thousands and thousands of people pouring through the gates to witness horses racing just for a few moments, reaching speeds of up to 70 kilometers an hour. And in this environment, you would have everybody rubbing shoulders together, royalty alongside you, uh, shoe shiners. It was chaotic, noisy, and a, a bustling, incredible time. Now, in 1913, something very different was happening because these events were being filmed on cameras. And those images were going to be sent across the world, shown in, in cinemas and across the Commonwealth. Um, and so the action of this event was going to be uh, memorialized. And if you think about the start of the race, it's coming up to three o'clock, the horses are pacing, they're, they're frothing at the mouths, they're, they're ready to go. Starter pistol takes off. The horses belt out around the course. There is a horse running called Anma, who is the king's horse. And the rider is wearing the king's colours of red and blue. But he's not the favourite. The favourite is Craigmore, who is going uh, forward in violet. And there's a break between the groups of horses. The first with a chance at victory, while a second group lags slightly behind. Now, the way that most people watched the Derby live was in these uh, stalls, these arenas, pressed up against the white barrier that ran right alongside the course. And what would happen is once the horses had run past, people would dive underneath the barrier and follow the horses to the finish line. That was part of the tradition at that point. And at the, the sort of the, one of the really decisive moments in the race is Tattenham Corner, one of the big bends on the final stretch. There are three film cameras all trained on Tattenham Corner and the horses come around. The first group move ahead. They're going to have a chance at victory. Then there's a little gap and something extraordinary happens. A figure is shown going very calmly underneath the barrier, walking into the path of these speeding horses and reaching up towards the king's horse. Now, the, the horse sees this figure, tries to leap, jump to avoid them. The rider is thrown off the horse. The figure is smashed to the ground. The horse gets up, completes the race. The rider is unconscious and so is this figure alongside them. Now, the rider will recover. The other figure will not. They go on to die a few days later, never having regained consciousness. But while this figure is lying in their hospital bed, hate mail is piling up on their bedside table because it transpires 
that this figure dramatically knocked over and killed at the Derby was a woman named Emily Wilding Davidson. She was a suffragette and she became the martyr to the suffragettes cause. She uh, was a militant suffragette. She had been involved in quite uh, dangerous activities, including setting fire to um, post boxes. And she had been force fed over 40 times and imprisoned. She had uh, nearly died when she'd uh, thrown herself off a landing in a prison in order to save a fellow suffragette that was imprisoned with her. She had not meant to go to the Derby, it seemed. Nobody seemed to know why she was there. She was actually supposed to be down the road at the Suffragettes Fair in Kensington. But she purchased a return ticket. She had put two suffragettes flags inside her coat and she had made her way to the Derby to disrupt it. Did she mean to die? Well, as a result of her death, the move for women to get the vote was galvanized. It had stalled both the suffragists through peaceful legal measures and the suffragettes through more militant measures had reached a bit of a dead end in terms of, of pushing for the vote. But at Emily's funeral, tens of thousands of people lined the streets. It's the single highest attended non-royal funeral in English history at this point. Uh, the, the suffragettes are shown there in white, following through the streets of London. And just a matter of years later, they did indeed get the vote. And the reason I uh, I'm fascinated by Emily and her story, because she becomes this figurehead and people know so much about what happened to her at the Derby. But one thing that I found, which was a footnote on a footnote on a footnote in one of the many bo books and articles written about her, was that Emily, like me, was a medievalist. Now, I knew that the suffragettes had great affection for the medieval period. Uh, they were part of a whole medieval revivalist movement in the late Victorian and Edwardian period. You know, that's why the Houses of Parliament looks like a Gothic masterpiece. Um, and that's why the pre-Raphaelites were painting these sort of very fey looking women in towers. But, um, and indeed, you know, they make Joan of Arc one of their figureheads. This image you can see on the screen at the moment is a huge sculpture that was at the entrance to the suffragettes fair where Emily was supposed to be and the suffragettes have uh, the phrase the, the, the slogan deeds not words but they started to tie that to Joan of Arc's slogan which is fight on and God shall give the victory we see her again on this uh, example of the suffragette magazine shown on the front she was this perfect example of androgynous militant activity and the perfect rallying cry for the suffragettes who weren't just politically engaged, but also very pious Christian individuals. So she was a saint and she was a warrior who was fighting against um, this idea of women as the second sex, went on to in fact lead the French army to victory, a 16 year old peasant girl from Orléans. Uh, in an extraordinary historical twist. But why did I find it so significant that Emily Wilde Davidson was a medievalist? Well, I dug deeper. I started to look further into her writings. She wrote many, many articles and, and poems and stories, all set in the medieval period. She had actually gone to Oxford to sit her finals in medieval literature, but because in the, you know, the turn of the 20th century, women couldn't graduate, they could, they could sit their finals, but they couldn't get a degree, she, she obviously didn't, didn't get to that final life achievement. But she, she continued to write particularly about Chaucer, and her favourite tale, it seems, even from childhood, was The Knight's Tale. She even calls herself Fair Emily after the main protagonist. Now, something, something very significant happens in The Knight's Tale that doesn't come into the story of why Emily died at the Epsom race. In that story, there is a description of how the Amazons, the female warrior women, wanted to appeal to Theseus, to the ruler, when he returned from battle. They, they wanted to appeal to the king, appeal to the ruler. And so they lay in the streets and one of them offered up a gift to the king. Is that what Emily was actually doing? Did she want to die or was she in fact petitioning the king? 
if she had been, then she was following a long medieval tradition of the king being uh, accountable to his subjects and people being able to appeal to him. She chose the race course, she chose the horse with deadly consequences, but ultimately her aim was successful. What I found really interesting when I started to read Emily's stuff was as a medievalist, I realized that she and so many of the other suffragettes did not believe that they were forging forward into a vacuum. They did not believe that their militant activities and their desire to have rights for women was something that had, had never been gone before. What they instead seemed to be believing was that there was a time hundreds of years ago where women had greater agency, greater power, greater autonomy than they had in the 20th century. Now, this flies in the face of what I said at the beginning, isn't it, about this idea of continual progress, continual movement towards a better future. I dug some more and it was really shocking what I uncovered. I have been studying the medieval period my whole life. And yet I only realized in the course of writing my book, Femina, that so many of the injustices we battle with today, including racism, classism, ableism, um, and of course, you know, misogyny and sexism, these divisions in society that we still lean into and are still fighting against, their genesis is relatively recent. It's with the, the Reformation from the 15th century onwards, 16th century onwards, that we start to get this idea of a woman's place is in the home. It is as empire and colonies uh, expand into after the Industrial Revolution that we get a sense of a rigid class system. If we get a sense of the, the proper right way that an Englishman conducts himself abroad and women's relation to that and people of other backgrounds relationship to that. And these are more recent phenomenon. They, you might assume that if you look to the medieval period, you will see a time where there is great division, where there is no opportunity for women, where the church, it's all encompassing misogyny and power actually suppresses and oppresses women. In fact, I found so many exceptions to that rule. It's John Calvin in the 16th century that says a woman's place is in the home. We move on from that to where we are today. And looking backwards, even back to the 7th, 8th, 9th century AD, you can find women as equal, if not greater, landowners, traders, artists, scientists, polymaths, creatives, writers. And they had a space available to the her, funnily enough, um, through that most patriarchal of institutions, the, the church, a the Catholic church, because... Convents, double monasteries, anchorites, even lay religious, uh, lay women who were uh, mystics, they had spaces that took them out of the domestic sphere. While the majority of women in the medieval period would be wives, mothers, aunts, uh, while they would be forced into arranged marriages uh, and, and then suffer death very often through childbirth, live under the fear of, of physical abuse and rape, there was a one other option available, which was to enter into one of these spaces, a convent, a double monastery, a collection of, of women living together in safety, in sanctuary. And today we might think of the words nun and the words convent and think of something frightfully pious and separate from the world, quiet places with, you know, where you know, people are just dead, taking themselves away from the pleasures of life in order to, to sort of indulge their spiritual enterprises. But in fact, these spaces in the medieval period were, they were everything. They were the universities, the hospitals, they were the publishing houses, the art, art centers, the music centers, the creative hubs of the medieval world. And in these spaces, women were creating uh, pieces on in all disciplines that were equal to, if not rivaling their male counterparts. I could tell you about Hildegard of Bingham, the polymath from the 12th century, from the um, 12th century Rhineland, who I think exceeds Leonardo da Vinci in her intellect and achievements. Um, I could tell you about Marjorie Kemp, the fabulous medieval mystic from King's Lynn, who uh, you tried her hand at all sorts of different businesses and ultimately reinvented herself in the way that an influencer would today. But I'm going to settle on um, 
on another example. But just before I, I tell you about them, I want to think about why looking at the past differently matters. When I studied history at school, to be honest, I hated it. I did dates, data and details about great men who had gone before. I couldn't see myself in the past at all. And as a result, I went on to think, well, I'm going to read literature. Books tell me about how people from the past thought. I can find myself more in books and in art and in archaeology and in artifacts. History felt like I, I was excluded from it. But the discipline of history is changing. We're thinking more about social history, about um, the people on the edges of society, about how an individual in, its, in their exceptional nature only is there by virtue of the societies, the communities, the, the ideologies around them. And that is how I'm trying to discover, rediscover the lost women of the medieval period. And I am fighting with many mistruths, many things that have been taught to us across time and uh, assumed to be facts. Let me take you very briefly to the world of the Vikings. Now, if you go to any fancy dress shop, the first thing you'll be handed if you say you want a Viking outfit is a horned helmet. But in fact, the Vikings never wore horned helmets. No horned helmets have ever been discovered in a Viking context. The headpieces they would have worn were more like skull caps designed to sort of protect the, the head during battle. And in fact, wearing a horn helmet would have been entirely impractical. It would have made you unbalanced. It would have made you stand out on a battlefield. And if you got one whack, whack in the wrong place, you'd have a horn going straight through your skull. So no, they didn't wear horned helmets. Where has this come from? It's come from the 19th, 20th century. And it occurred when Wagner's ring cycle was being staged. Apparently, the costume designer, just before the uh, opera was due to, to be released, went to the back of the auditorium and realized they could not tell the difference between the good characters and the bad characters. So they went back down, changed the costumes. They put wings on the good characters' helmets and horns on the bad characters' helmets. And from that time, we have been told Vikings worn, horn, worn war horned helmets. It is not true. And it is one of so many mistruths about the Vikings. But how can finding women change our view? Very briefly, this is the Burka warrior grave. It was discovered at the turn of the 20th century, and it was declared the finest warrior grave ever discovered. In it was an individual on a throne, surrounded by a full armory of weapons with a mare and a stallion sacrificed at their feet. And because there were weapons in there, the archaeologist said, it's a man. And because it's the greatest warrior grave, it was a man. Fast forward to 2017, technology, DNA analysis, advances in science meant that we could return to this burial. And what they did was run the DNA and they discovered two X chromosomes. The Burka warrior was the Burka warrior woman. Why does this matter? It matters because we now have new tools to discover what has always been hidden in plain sight, that women always did have rights, but they have been written out of records, that women always did have agency, but that that has been stripped away. By finding the women from the medieval past, I have been inspired to see potential for myself that I didn't believe was there in the past. You cannot be what you cannot see. And I am going to present to you in that book so many people that will inspire us to think differently and think about a more equal, balanced future that in many ways is more like the past. Thank you, everybody, for listening to me.